Modifying a 5 inch gauge Great Western Railway 14XX steam locomotive part 10, fixing the lamp brackets properly, machining the coupling rod retainers and getting my hydraulic test rig ready. Starting with the lamp brackets. The way that the lamp brackets were fitted originally was a terrible job. The brackets are lost wax castings, with the heads of the bolts cast into the metal, and underneath each of the lamp brackets also cast in were a couple of protrusions that pressed into two holes in the footplate. And this is no good at all, so you can see what I've done here. I've drilled out the dummy bolts and I'm going to bolt them in properly. And while my massive hands are in the shot, please note this is not a king scale or silver crest model locomotive. This engine was bought directly from the manufacturer in China. Once again, I find myself using one of these very cheap, very good, laser cut out of a sheet spanners from Blackgate's Engineering. These are very sharp and pointy and get into places where my other spanners will not. I featured these small spanners in a video a while back and one viewer said, well you wouldn't catch me using such cheap spanners like this, you need chrome vanadium. And yes, I have some chrome vanadium spanners, quite a few, but I couldn't get them into this small space. Fitting these very small 8BA hexagon bolts was a real test of patience, but I got there in the end, and in this clip I'm just touching in the bolt heads with some black paint. The paint that I'm using is some cellulose paint from an aerosol can. Here's a useful tip. When brush painting aerosol can paint, which is very thin, it's a good idea to just spray some of it into the cap of the aerosol, but before you actually use it and start painting with it, leave the aerosol can with the bit of painting on the bench for a while. After about 20 minutes, some of the solvent will have evaporated, so the paint ratio to solvent becomes less, and the paint is thicker and much easier to brush paint on the components. I bought these superb lost wax casting oil lamps from Blackgate's Engineering, and it's time to fit the lenses in the front of them, and for this I'm using a Loctite 603 retainer substitute. It states clearly in the instructions, do not use cyanoacrylate adhesive or CA glue or super glue, because that type of adhesive can affect the plastic. Moving down to the bottom part of the engine, it's now time to do a bit of machining on the coupling rod retainers that I made in the last episode. They look okay as they are really, but I need to make them look more scale-like. So what I'm going to do is machine a flat down each side of them. And for that, I'm using one of the original countersunk bolts, which holds the countersunk washer very tightly to a nut that's held in the machine vise. A quick reference to the bolts. Apart from machining off the writing, I also machined the diameter slightly less. I did this in an attempt to make the bolt head look more like the end of the crank pin, because that's what it appears to be on a photograph of the full-sized item. The reason that I mention that is that in the milling operation I'm going very close to the bolt, but when I fit the actual bolts that I've machined back in place, there'll be a little bit more clearance from the end of the bolt to the flat that I've created with the milling machine. A fairly important piece of information when using a milling machine, always take the cuts with the cutter revolving in a direction towards the work, not away from it. I'm not going to show the machining of all four, you have to take my word for it that I did machine all four of them. Now in this clip I'm cleaning them up, first of all with a needle file and then on a piece of wet or dry sandpaper, just to remove any burrs. This is getting a bit like mass production, I have four of these to do, but it's worth taking the time to do this because you don't want any sharp edges and they would look entirely wrong. I'm also cleaning up the flat part to remove some of the milling machine marks. As a general rule of thumb, I would always say, if you're making parts for your model steam locomotive or stationary engine or whatever you like, always treat the parts that you're making as models in their own right, which indeed they are. This after all is a model of a part that on the full-size steam locomotive holds the coupling rods in place. I should really say for this particular part, it holds one end of the coupling rod in place. What I'm going to do is quickly bolt the parts in place and have a look at them and see whether it's an improvement on the original. I assume that on the original full size item that the flats are probably not in line, but on my small model I'm going to make sure they're in line with each other. As you can see by the full size photograph there's another machining operation yet to do. I don't think I'm going to bother with the very tiny bolt. In this scale it would probably have to be about 12 BA, I can't even see those these days. I'll finish the machining off in the next episode because I need to get the engine ready for the hydraulic test. This is the blanking plug that I made that fits in the safety valve hole. All of the holes into the boiler are now securely plugged, but of course I have to get some water in there. 
so I'm going to fit a Steam Union connector to the top of this plug. It's in the lathe chuck, I'm using a centre drill as usual, then I'm drilling it tapping size for 3 8 by 32 threads per inch. For a tapping size drill for ME threads, I've always used two imperial sizes lower than the diameter of the thread. This is probably not 100% correct, but I've done it for about 45 years and it seems to have worked for me. Which is just as well because I have a very limited supply of metric drill bits. And as you can see here, the commercial union, which is 3 8 by 32 threads per inch, fits perfectly in the component that I've just threaded using a drill two imperial sizes down from 3 8 so now, without further ado, I'm going to fill the boiler right up to the top with water. It is most important that you fill the boiler right to the top. There must be no air in there at all. And it's equally important to not spill any water on the engine. So I'm using an airline to blow away any spillage. So what's with the airline? What's the importance of blowing away the water? Well. During the hydraulic test, I will be looking for any water that's leaking from the boiler. So I don't want to mistake leaking water for any water that was spilt on the engine in the filling process. This is my test rig. It's a very simple thing. It's a hand pump from Blackheads Engineering as usual, and a good quality large pressure gauge that goes up to 400 psi. And what I've done is temporarily fitted a valve to the outlet, so I can demonstrate the principle. The valve is closed and as I pump the pressure up you will notice that it drops when I stop pumping the handle because some of the water is getting pushed back through the pump to the water tank. In practice this is not a problem. Watch what happens when I undo the valve. There is a sudden release of water. If I was using steam or compressed air for this test, undoing the valve at such a speed would be a very noisy operation as the steam or air would suddenly expand into the atmosphere. But as water is not compressible, all that happens is you just get a bit of a quick squirt of water from the valve, like this. And as the pressure was at 250 pounds per square inch, it's very much a non-event. So I'm all set for the pressure test, but what I'm going to do is take my test rig into the steam workshop to have it calibrated, to make sure that it's accurate. I'm pretty sure that it is, but for the purposes of obtaining a boiler test certificate, it has to be calibrated properly. And what that means is, instead of having to drag the engine into the steam workshop because it's heavy, Simon can pop down to my house and we can test it on my workbench. I'll be videoing this event very shortly, but that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.